previously I couldn't have shown you this QR code, but uh, this QR code is for questions. If you have questions, it will point you to a Google form that will be able to take your questions and an email address, and I will offer free consultancy if you write me to that email address. Um, you can ask me absolutely anything, uh, of course, related to Jenkins. <laughs> so no live questions. Um, so as I said earlier, continuous delivery is a software methodology inspired by Agile. It helps us by um, decreasing cost. And how it does that? It does that by uh, building software frequently, uh, integrating changes frequently, and this permits us to avoid um, huge mistakes later in the process. Of course, if you deliver often, you'll have a shorter time to market, and you will have a lit, uh, low cost of delivering software. How it works is the, by starting a build on every commit, if, you, if it's possible. So as a developer, you commit to the repository, then the code starts to build automatically, um, and the build artifact, which is resulting in this process, is then stored in an artifact repository, such as Nexus or Artifactory. And uh, from that repository, it's uh, automatically taken and delivered into the the environment which you want to deliver it on. The flow is pretty much the same in every company. You start by planning what you want to implement in the current, uh, let's say, sprint or in the current build process. Then you start coding. You uh, commit the code to the repository. You start building the code. After that, you test the code with you test the resulting um, artifact. Using a release uh, tool, you decide which on, on which environment you want that uh, artifact to be deployed. And uh, after that, you deploy the artifact and uh, put it in production for the operation team to take care of it. As you can see in this uh, shimmering uh, screen, you have the first three phases of uh, the software delivery process covered by the Agile process. If you want further um, coverage, let's say with the building and the testing, you have to have continuous integration. And this is the main topic of this today's meeting. And uh, after that, you, if you want to take that binary artifact and put it into the different environments, you need to have continuous delivery. If you want to have them also deployed on production, you will also will, would want continuous deployment. And in the next slide, I will show you some tools that can help us along the way. Jenkins is discreetly placed up there, but the most, most of the tools are, <coughs> I will describe them a little bit. You have Jira and Confluence for planning. Um, of course, the list is not complete. You can have HPALM or you can have any other, uh, yeah, no, no, no HPALM. Sorry, guys that are using HPALM. Um, you can have any other planning tool. Thanks. Um, it, that was the reaction to HP ALM. Uh, you can have any, any tool that uh, can help you in, in the planning phase. And after that, you start coding with Eclipse or IntelliJ or Atom or whatever editor of text you wish to, to use for code. Um, you can then submit the code to the uh, SCM, that means software um, I forgot what the SCM is for. Uh, you, you submit it to Git or Subversion. Uh, then you have uh, the build phase, which is done by the Maven uh, build system. 
This is one example of build system. Of course, you can have also Gradle or Ivy or Ant or Make or MS Build or whatever uh, environment you prefer. Uh, then <clears throat> you, during the build phase, you get the binary artifact and then push it to some repository management tool such as Artifactory or Nexus. Uh, from there, or during the build phase, you can also do some tests with JUnit. Uh, there are some other frameworks that I have not included there, which are Cucumber. Um, you can have Selenium for tests. You can have HP Quick Test Pro or U Unified Functional Testing. Uh, you can have, uh, you, you can test your code using SonarCube, which is a code quality check tool. Then after the tests are, let's say, the, let's say successful, you perform a release, and the release is performed using tools such as uh, ServiceNow, such as uh, Excel Release, which is a tool from Xebia Labs, and uh, plain old Excel file, if you have that. Because you need to synchronize all the versions between the modules that, are, that you are deploying. And speaking about deploying, you can have tools such as Docker for automating, uh, en encapsulating and containerizing the deployment. You can have uh, Chef or Ansible for environments provisioning from scratch. This ensures us uh, that the environments are not having configuration drift and are respecting the same uh, configuration that you intended for them in the beginning. And for the operation part, you can have uh, tools such as uh, virtualization tools like VMware or VirtualBox, which, are, which can be controlled by Vagrant if you're developing or operating on a local machine, or you can have um, cloud solutions such as Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services if you want to, to operate in the cloud. Um, I have uh, described a little bit of the coding uh, process, but now I will go in further details. You start by, you know, getting what you have to develop from the planning tools or the scrum planning meetings. Um, <clears throat> then you start to code the desired changes, and then you commit the changes into SVN, or Git, or whatever uh, versioning system you are preferring to use. I highly recommend Git. Um, Jenkins is uh, listening to those uh, software versioning tools, servers, and when it notices some changes in the repository, it then pulls out the code locally or on the build slaves and starts the building phase. The, the way it does that, it can be done in several ways. First, you can do that by polling frequently, or you can do that by using uh, asynchronous uh, triggers, such as a Gerrit trigger, or um, if you're using Gerrit, or big bucket hooks, if you're using big bucket. <coughs> uh, the idea of this is to have um, the build starting as soon as ready, as soon as possible when the code is committed into the repository. After the build starts, the following can happen. You can have a, a number of build slaves in the Jenkins uh, architecture that are, are used to run the, um, the build, that are, that are having pre-installed Maven, let's say, or some other build system that you are using. And uh, this build slave can either be physically present or they can be um, started on demand by Jenkins. So that is a very important thing. You can have build slaves that are in the Amazon Web Services cloud, or you can have build slaves that are in a OpenStack infrastructure that are only used 
during the period of the build. This changes things a little bit from the permanent building servers because they are started, the solution is built, and then they are decommissioned as soon as the build is finished. Slaves can, the, the Jenkins slave can either be Linux or Unix. Um, and of course, they can also run in Docker containers. The communication between Jenkins and the build slaves is done via SSH or a pro protocol in Java called JNLP. Um, the after the build starts, if you're using Maven, the, the corresponding dependencies are pulled from directly from Maven, or if you are using an artifact repository, it can be pulled locally. And then after the build is uh, finished, the resulted artifact is stored back again into the artifact repository solution, which can be Nexus or Artifactory, or some other solution. <coughs> uh, testing follows after this stage. Testing should be as automated as possible. Testing should um, have as many unit tests possible in the code, written in the code. And to check for that, you, you can use tools such as Java code coverage, which can uh, give you a report of how much of the code you have tested. Uh, if you want to test quality of the code, let's see how well you've written the code, you can use a tool such as SonarCube. If the tests are successful, we are ready to move to the next phase. If the text are, tests are not successful, you can pull back and correct the test, correct the bugs, and then restart the cycle again with a new commit. Release in a continuous delivery world is a little bit obsolete, but some companies are using this methodology which is, a, let's say, a legacy from the waterfall world, to have a better control of the releases. Because you can have releases uh, that are built daily, but the client would want to have, let's say, bi-monthly releases. And this is uh, the role of the release manager. He can then say when to do it and how to do it if you want a release. If you have the already built artifact stored in the artifact repository, you can then safely use that artifact to deploy on different environments. And this is what the deployment phase is doing. You can deploy to QA, you can deploy to pre-production, you can deploy to, let's say, an integration environment, and this is done automatically. So, to answer the question why you are here, why Jenkins? Because Jenkins is first of all free, it's open sourced, it has an enthusiastic basis of uh, a community which is enthusiastic about it. If you want to have professional support and paid support, you can, you gotta know that there is a company called CloudBees which is offering commercial support for Jenkins. Uh, the solution has uh, been around for quite some time. It's been here since 2005, if I'm not wrong. It, and it's been a fork of Hudson, uh, which was a tool developed by some Japanese guy which was working for Sun. Um, it uh, has a very, very, very rich uh, ecosystem of plugins. It has a plugin for everything. You can do everything with it. It integrates nicely with every possible solution that you might think of in the continuous uh, integration world. Um, it, can, it, it is very easy to learn. The learning curve is very steep. And uh, it has, uh, a, it, he's very, it, it's very flexible because you can develop uh, extensions for it very easily. 
it has its own programming language, let's say, which is a combination of Java and uh, Groovy. Both are available, actually. And what is great about Jenkins is that it's configurable via scripting. You don't have to click through the interface to configure Jenkins. You have to, you can run a script like Ansible, like an Ansible playbook, to have a up and running Jenkins instance configured however you wanted by a click of a button. Everything in Jenkins, from jobs to what the jobs do, are configurable via scripting. I will come back to that later in the presentation. OK, so how do you set, set up Jenkins for CI? You obviously have to install it first. But if you are lazy enough not to want to install it, there is also a Docker image for it that you can download and run on your local Docker machine. Um, it installs everywhere. It installs on Windows. It installs on Linux. It installs in a Docker. I heard about Windows and <laughs> <laughs> it installs on everything. But of course, I recommend it the best with Linux. However, there are cases when using uh, tools from the Microsoft world that are requiring Jenkins, and that's why I, they offer this possibility to run it on Windows also. Uh, you can, after, after you start, after you install it, the first step asks you to install some default plugins. Um, I have put together a list of plugins that I mostly use all the time because I want, to, I want you to have this presentation as a basis for uh, what you can start doing with Jen Jenkins. Um, so if you want this presentation, you can ask me and I will send it to you or you can contact me by that URL and send me your email address and I will send it back to you. So yeah, that, that is some sort of an excuse because all these slides have a lot of text in them. So I know it's not recommended, but you can use this for future reference if you want. Of course, this is what I use the most, and that is what I use the most. But you can have uh, various requirements. So if you want to change something from there, go ahead. I will quickly go through these uh, plugins. Mm -hmm. If you want source control, you're going to have to install the Git plugin. This is a must, and I think the Jenkins by default comes with this plugin pre-installed lately. Uh, if you want to integrate it with uh, authentication, you must install the LDAP plugin. After that, you can have security groups set up for LDAP, and then you can start uh, installing, uh, y then you can start configuring user rights for, for div diverse jobs, let's say. Um, if you want to have testing frameworks, there are a lot of plugins pertaining to those. I won't go into those details. I use Maven a lot, so I always install Maven at the beginning. And if I want to use infrastructure such as Docker, I will install the Docker plugin, and after that, um, if I want to use Amazon, I simply install Amazon, configure some, configure some configuration items, some a little bit, and then I have access to my Amazon cloud instances. Um, some very important plugins are the pipeline plugin, which I will talk in detail a little bit about the next slides. Uh, job DSL, which allows for configuration of the jobs via a scripting language, so you don't have to click through the interface. Um, audit trail, which is very useful if jobs are disappearing and you don't know why. And uh, monitoring, which allows us for monitoring of resources of the build slaves that are used. Um, it's good to know that uh, when something fails, you can be notified about it. 
Jenkins has a lot of way to integrate with a lot of notification services, and I will name only the cool ones. Uh, Slack, HipChat, you can, I don't know who uses IRC anymore, but it's there if you are using IRC. This one's for you. And um, I also do some cosmetic plugins. I can, I modify the team because I find it very old and looking pretty bad, even in the new Jenkinses. And uh, I do really hate the blue balls. The, the, the balls that are in the jobs. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I, I install uh, the Chuck Norris plugin because on, on every build it gives me some, some wisecrack joke with Chuck Norris. And, uh, you know, scrolling through the logs can be very, very boring and annoying and a joke really makes the day better <coughs> after you pulled your hair out. Um, so. In setting up Jenkins, as I mentioned earlier, you start by configuring security, because by default Jenkins, when you start it, is pretty pretty open. You can access it from every access it from everywhere. So yeah, the first step is to configure security. <coughs> I then add credentials and put everything into place so that I can I can communicate securely with the outside world. The credentials can be username and passwords, uh, AWS keys. Uh, SSH keys or whatever. I take care of the communication. Then I will configure build tools. Uh, this way, this you can do in two separate ways. Either you go into the slave environment and install it manually and then reference that in, in the tool configuration, or Jenkins is kind enough to offer you a tool himself. himself. You can select a list of tools from the tool configuration and he will take care of installing them for you. So another point for Jenkins. Um, then you, you integrate with the software versioning systems that you are using, like Git or SVN, and you customize the interface because I don't like the old interface as I said. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this was a joke, but I spoiled it. Next, uh, I was going to say that <laughs> I'm going to talk about jobs and, yeah, not these jobs, but Jenkins jobs. I spoiled it. Yeah, you, you could see it there anyway, so it's not really spoiled. Um, you can configure Jenkins jobs by but, but first, let me say, what is a Jenkins job? A Jenkins job is a set of instructions coming from you to Jenkins. Because Jenkins by itself is not that bright. It's just a servant for you. You have to be the brain behind Jenkins. So yeah, you have to configure jobs. You have to give him something to do. And you have to give him something to do either manually, you go into the interface and that build steps and pre-build steps and configure environments and so on and so forth. But then you can use this wonderful thing called job DSL. I really, really suggest you into looking in, to look into that uh, way of configuring Jenkins jobs, which offers a programmatic way of defining jobs. Uh, the jobs can be, I give some small examples, can be freestyles, can be Maven jobs, and can be um, a pipeline job which is a special kind of job, and I will talk about it later on. Um, usually, ah, and the very special latest new hit, multi-branch pipeline. Um, a typical job is configured like this. You start by defining the CCM, SCM from which you take the code. You configure some job triggers because you want that job to be started somewhere. You don't want to go into the Jenkins every day and uh, press play, build now. This is not automation, so you need some way to trigger the jobs. And this can be done either uh, periodically, you set up a schedule like cron, in, it, it actually respects the cron format, and then you uh, 
the job starts at a, in, at a defined interval. Uh, also, you can do triggers. So Jenkins can feel some way uh, when the information is updated in the, into the code repository, and then it pulls that information and starts the, the build. Uh, you can add job parameters if you like. It's not a mandatory step. Then you can inject some variable environment variables. You can set up a Maven to start the build. Maybe run some shell script commands. I don't know. Archive the artifacts, publish the reports. This is some typical job. And notify someone if something go, goes wrong or if something is, is good. The good thing is that every step that you'd see there in green points can be automatized using job DSL. Um, not everything should be done in, May in Jenkins. Some things can be done in Maven also. So if you want to run some unit tests, if you want to run a sonar cube analysis, or if you want to uh, publish that artifact into Artifactory or Nexus, you can configure that in the Maven, POM, XML file. Of course, you can configure it in Jenkins also, but it, from my experience, is less flexible and uh, adds some more times time if you configure it in Jenkins. So some things are better to be left in the Maven POM XML file. <coughs> Okay, I will talk a little bit about the pipeline plugin, which is a very powerful way of defining workflows in Jenkins. Um, you basically st split each step of the process into stages, stages that are visible as columns, there, up there, and uh, each build will be visually represented using those pipelines. And they will pass through. The color is not really cool there, but these ones are green. Everything here is green. And if something fails, the whole line is red. And you can see where it failed. And you can go into the logs and check it. And yeah, that's really nice. Um, this isolates the errors better, and uh, gives you an overview of how well things are going, or how bad. It's too small, but there is a code written there in the left side down, which is a pipeline definition. This is a very small example. In reality, pipelines can be very complex. They can have uh, conditional structures, they can have uh, ifs, they can cover a lot of uh, situations. And the uh, new star in town is a multi-branch pipeline, which is basically the same thing as a normal pipeline, but is automatically started when you have a Jenkins file in the root of the code branch. So you have branches in the repository. If you place there a Jenkins file the, and you configure a, a pipeline job, Jenkins will notice it and automatically will start the building of that job. Uh, you can, this allows for some very interesting things to be done, which, uh, which are <coughs> you can have a different pipeline depending on what branch you are on. So yeah, that's a very, very good feature you can have in Jenkins. Different branches can have different pipelines, um, different processes. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, deleting the branch also deletes the, the build job. OK, so I'm very close to, to finishing this. So um, I hope that Jenkins is going to help you in the next steps that you are performing in the continuous integration world because it's a great orchestrator. It integrates great with everything you know of 
And if you don't know, some, if, you, the, if there is something that you cannot integrate with, a plugin will most surely appear out of nowhere as soon as possible. Uh, the community is very enthusiastic. Um, it, it's very secure. It has a very powerful workflow engine that can help you model all your continuous integration process. And um, as the logo said, is a good servant for you in the CI topics. And thank you very much for coming, for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And um, if you want to ask me questions, just use that for free. Questions? Yes, yes, yes. Questions, of course. Uh, hello. I'm currently working on uh, automating uh, the deployment of uh, Jenkins Master with multiple slaves uh, with their jobs and dependencies. And uh, uh, did you found any way to deploy the slaves automatically, including the SSH keys and everything that needs to be? set in order for the slaves to work without doing anything manual? On what infrastructure? If you're doing that in, in the, if you are using build slaves in OpenShift, or if you are doing- On EC2. On EC2? In Amazon, yes. Um, the, the way I did it was to configure my own AMI with uh, included with some preset uh, uh, SSH, SSH keys. keys. Yeah. All right, thank you. But, but if you do that, you can, I advise you to use a tool like Ansible to come later and change the key to a different one, maybe, which is set up on Jenkins yeah. for security reasons. Yes, thank you. Welcome. So we're a bit short on time, that's why we're gonna cut the questions here. It was an awesome talk. Orlando, thank you so much. And you have all his contacts, so please send a yeah. lot of spam. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Awesome. Um, so we're gonna have like a minute break.